idle. I'm going to try the other one, PyCharm. If you brought your own laptop and you don't have PyCharm, that's totally okay. If you don't want to try um, PyCharm because you've used idle already and you're happy with that, that's cool. I'm going to give it a shot though. So use whichever you want you want. I know that you know how to use idle, so you can stick with that. I'm going to go ahead and launch PyCharm by going to the start menu, typing in PyCharm. And you never know, I may switch back to idle in just a few minutes if I don't like it. Alrighty, if it says import PyCharm settings from, I guess just choose OK if you get that menu, that option. And at some point, hopefully it'll do something. Here we go. Now what PyCharm is, is it's a better IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment. IDLE is an integrated development environment. What does an integrated development environment mean? It means it gives you a text window where you can, you know, enter your code. And then, you know, it gives you a run option and it gives you a window for your output. And that way you don't have to do, you know, all of those things separately. You don't have to create a file and notepad and then go and uh, go to the command line and run something. You know, that's an option. You can always do that kind of thing. But it's better just to type something in right into idle and then, uh, you know, click the run. Okay, so... If you're doing PyCharm, go ahead and do create new project. If you're doing um, idle, do file new, you know, and save it where it's supposed to go. Alrighty, and so here it's asking me for a location to save all of my stuff. I'm going to click the, uh, the button here to move this to my CIT1113 folder or wherever you are saving your things. So the little box over here. Search the base directory. Okay, fine. If this gets too hard, I'll get annoyed. Okay, mine is on the desktop. That's where I put my 1113 folder. It didn't make it too hard to find. You could just stick yours right on the desktop, or you could just leave it where it was. Be nice to know, to know where it was, though, so that if, if and when you upload your final result. So if you do that, it'll say... Directory is not empty. Would you like to create project? No, we don't want to create a project from existing files. We're done with those files. We want to create some new stuff. And for those of y'all walking in late, might be too late to catch up. So in that case, just go ahead and uh, launch idle instead. What we're doing is we're trying out PyCharm. And so what I've done is I've chose pure Python. I created OK. Checked OK. Creating virtual environment. Well, this takes a lot longer than idle. That's one reason. Yeah, that's one reason to stick with idle, isn't it? Didn't expect it to take, you know, 30 minutes just to create a file. Honestly, when I did it on my machine downstairs, it cranked quite right up, so I'm surprised it's taking this long. Yeah. I'm about to say to heck with this because I see the little progress bar going along the bottom. Yes. All right, forget it. I'm going to minimize this so that it can finish doing its little cleanup, but I don't want to waste any more time. So I'm going to minimize it. Launch idle. We'll go back to that another day. So the textbook makes a big deal about something called a sentinel value. So I just want to go ahead and demonstrate that. Then we're going to go back to pseudocode and we're going to do some flow charting, stuff like that. But I want to kind of knock the sentinel value out of the, uh, the ballpark. So what I'm going to do is file new. I'm going to call it Feb6. So save as. Make sure it goes into my correct folder and not into Python 3632. All right. Wow, we haven't done a program since Jan 23. That's kind of annoying. All righty. So feb6.py. Okay. 
always put your name and your date up at the top which is kind of professional and so we're going to demonstrate IO and Sentinel values among other things but you know it's always a good idea to put your name up at the top if it was an assignment you know put homework three or whatever it's not February 2 I think I said six and type two something like that okay so the first thing I want this program to do is to go ahead and illustrate the idea of a Sentinel value and what is the Sentinel value? The Sentinel value is a value that tells it to stop after you enter, enter a series of data. Like if you're trying to multiply, you know, a whole bunch of numbers together, you're trying to add them together, you know, type in a new number or negative one to quit or that kind of thing. Type in a student ID or 9999 to exit. That 9999 or that negative one are values that don't mean anything in terms of the kind of data you're expecting. You know, there's no student ID negative one, or there's no student, you know, ID 9999 in this world. It doesn't mean anything in terms of what we want, and so that signals us that we want to stop. So that's what a signal value is. You know, a signal is somebody who sits there watching or whatever. We're going to have a signal value making sure that we can stop. Otherwise, you can write a loop that will run forever. And if you write a loop that runs forever, it's called an infinite loop, and it's usually not a good thing. Uh, you know, in that case, you just have to kill the program with the X, but you might not be there to kill the program. User may not know how to do it. It may be running without a window, in which, called it's, in which case it's called a service, or in uh, Linux world, I believe they're called, you know, demons, demons. So let's write some kind of program. Let's just add a series of numbers. And in this case, if we're going to be doing stuff that you're you're not familiar with yet, that's okay. Just, you know, it's kind of like watching tennis before you get out in the, you know, and actually start playing it. Okay, so we're going to declare a variable called total so that we can start adding numbers to it. We want to give them some instructions. Print into a number to add or Minus 9999 nine, 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 add, that's too much, or minus 1 to quit. I'm just going to put a comment here. Minus 1 is our sentinel value that will stop the loop. And there's always more than one way to write a loop. I'm just going to write it using this syntax because it seems to be all righty. So we need an input value. And normally I would think input's a great uh, variable name. Unfortunately, if ever you type a variable and it shows up as purple or a different color than the rest of your stuff, like total, it means it's a keyword or a function, and we don't want to use it. So I'm just going to say num. How about that? That's easy. Is equal to zero. That's going to be our starting value. We can set this equal to anything as long as it's not our sentinel value. So now we're going to write a while loop. What a while loop is, is it marks a block of code that keeps repeating until a certain condition is met. And when that condition is no longer true, then it exits the loop. So it'll stop the program at that point. So while our number is not equal, you see that exclamation mark, that's not a one, it's an equal sign, is not equal to our sentinel value, not equal space negative one, colon, and everything under this needs to be tabbed over until we exit our loop. So what are we going to do? We're going to ask the user for a value. We need to tell them what we want. As a matter of fact, this print statement could just be moved down there. I'm going to do that. I'm going to erase this line. Oh, by the way, when you see me do this magic thing that highlights an entire line like that for quick editing, what I'm doing is I'm holding the shift key and the down cursor, right? 
And if you want to select text to the left and the right, it's a lot faster than grabbing your mouse. Okay, so I'm going to delete that line. I'm going to come and grab this line. You can use a mouse if you'd like. So shift down cursor highlights the whole line. I'm going to come and cut it, which you can do with a control key, control C. I'm going to come down here and paste it, which you can do with a control V, but I'm just going to choose that menu option. Okay. Why did I put this in the loop? Because I wanted to say that every single time. You know, if the user has entered 7,000 different numbers and they're ready to stop, I don't want them to have to remember how to stop. And, oh, I guess I better scroll up to the top because I remember some instruction about how to quit. Okay, so here we go. Let's get our value. Num is equal to input. And as always, you don't have to put the spaces in there that I do. Then we have to convert it to a real number because right now it's a string and a string is stored in the computer's memory completely different than a number. You can't do math on a string. The user may have typed in hello there and you know you can't do math with hello there. So we're going to convert it to a number. Num is equal to float parentheses num into parentheses. That turns it to a floating point number. I'll put a comment there. You don't have to type in all my comments, but comments are generally good things. If you can't type as fast as I do, then skipping the comments might be a way to keep up. So, convert input to a number for math. Right? Something like that. We have a number now. We could even put a comment saying what we're doing here. You can comment blocks of code, just like giving chapter headings. So I'm going to go above the print statement and put a comment here. Nah, no, forget it. Okay, so we have number now. If we want to make sure that our number is not the sentinel value, because we don't want to add negative 1 to our total. So if number not equal to negative 1, colon, let's add it to our total. Notice that that's indented. Total equals total plus 1. I'm going to put a little comment here to remind myself that if I wanted to shorten that, make it a little easier, I mean easier to type, I could say plus equals 1. That's a shortcut for saying total is equal to total plus 1. But right now I'm keeping the syntax as non-cryptic as possible. Okay, we are done with our loop. I like putting a little comment at the end of my wild end while. That doesn't really mean anything. The comments are just there for our purpose, for our understanding. The program would work just as well if we deleted all that red stuff. Okay, so when will it get to the end of the loop? After they've typed in a negative one. And let's print the total. The total is comma, or quote, the total is, end quote, comma, total. And then if we wanted to make the program capable to be run by double-clicking the icon via Windows, we'd want to put one last input statement just to get it to pause, but I'm going to leave that out. Okay. Now I'm going to run it, see if I have any syntax errors. So I saved it. You didn't see me do it because I just typed Control S. I kind of save compulsively to make sure that if the computer crashes, I still have my version of the program. So file save, run module, enter a number or add. What happens if I type in negative 1 right off the bat? Well, that makes sense. I didn't add any numbers. I'm going to give that another shot. Run, run module. Add a number, okay, 100. Add another number, 200, 300. Now hopefully when I quit that, it'll equal 600 because that's what 100 plus 200 plus 300 is. Well, well what do you know? I'm totally wrong. Where'd that come from? I didn't do this in order to show you all anything. I did this because I'm honestly confused. Let's go look. What did I do wrong? I see it now. 
that was a mistake. This is what's known as a logic error rather than a syntax error. Why is that wrong? It's like adding up bowling scores. Do you just want to add one to your bowling score? Who plays bowling? I don't know. And, you know, every time you do it? No, you want to add your score. So we got to change that to num right there. Total is equal to total plus num because that was just counting one, two, and three. And I'm going to change my little comment over here as well. Total plus equals num is the same thing. Run, run module. Add a number to add. Okay, try the same ones. 100, 200, 300. I'll do walkabout to help correct syntax errors in just a minute. Negative 1 to quit. The total is 600. Awesome possum. All right, so my program works. It does what I wanted it to do. It illustrates a couple of things. It illustrates input. Gets you used to the idea of a loop. It shows getting input and how we convert input into a number so we can do math with it. And, you know, signal value, showing output, kind of all that good stuff. For the most part, spacing doesn't matter. That's correct. So this is a, a reminder for the uh, people playing along at home. Once you load idle, don't enter your program there. Don't enter it at the three arrows. Instead, do file new. Do a save as. Get it into your coding directory. And then start your program. And so later on, when you want to come back and edit your program, you can open up idle. I just need to dock it, don't I? Then come over here and do file recent files. Fastest way to find it. Because if you go to Windows and you find it that way, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna find my program. And you know, and then you double click on it. Instead of editing it, it runs it. Not what you want. And yeah, you can probably right click on it and find the right place to edit it, open with, you know, I maybe edit with idle, but far easier to launch idle and then do recent files. Okay, as far as spacing, you can do that. Some places you can't leave out space, right, because it doesn't know what if num means. You got to do that. In other places, specifically the tabs, spacing is absolutely critical, and it won't run in this case because this is not space the same as that. Other programming languages use curly braces to denote a block of code like this. Don't type this because it's not correct for this language. You know, there we go. But that doesn't work in this language. In those languages, that's great because then you don't have to space everything at all. It doesn't matter. It's still a good idea to space it because it makes your code easier to read. Did I answer your question good enough? All right. Stop me. Okay, so I wish I could leave this on the screen while I went back to the lecture, but I can't. So we're going to go back into PowerPoint. All right, so we were talking about flowcharts last time. Let's go back to remind ourselves about pseudocode. This is pseudocode. It's not a programming code. If you type this into Python, you wouldn't even try to run it. It would give you all sorts of syntax errors. Pseudocode is just English. You put start and you put stop, which you don't put in our, uh, in our code. The rules for pseudocode is you put everything in lowercase except for the names of the variables. They kind of <coughs> violated that right there. I don't care. You type everything in uppercase. That's fine by me. However, Python is very case sensitive. If you type input with a capital I, it's not going to work. So input my number. Notice that's different than what we did, right? We typed in my number equals input parentheses in parentheses. That kind of illustrates the difference between pseudocode and programming language. This is just pure, simple English-like syntax. And then they do my answer. They have arrow, arrow. I don't remember if I added that. 
I may have modified this slide. I think the book actually, oops, go back. I think the book actually had it like that. So if you're looking at your own slide, I, I remember I was trying to illustrate that. It's an X. It doesn't matter in pseudocode, there's multiple ways. Some people use that arrow, some people use equal sign. I'm just going to like equal sign. And then print my answer. Again, notice the difference in the syntax because in our code, we put parentheses. So creating a flowchart. We have an input symbol. What is a flowchart? Flowchart looks like... Something like that. Let's see if we can find a better flow chart. I'm not seeing one I like. Oh, that's good enough. Oh, can we just actually pop one up, please, rather than making me edit it? All right. Blurry. Whatever got a thing that means start. I call it the oval. Actually, the book calls it the terminator. Terminator meaning the end, but you also put one at the beginning. When you're doing a flow chart, you do a terminator, you put start, just like on the pseudocode, and at the end you put stop. Then you put some blocks in it. The different shapes of blocks do different things. A square block is a mathematical kind of process. A angle like doing that conversion to a float or doing some adding. The input and the output is done in what it calls a parallelogram, which is a tilted rectangle. I'll probably call it a tilted rectangle because honestly that's a parallelogram and so is that, right? If you're gonna get all technical about it. So I call these rectangles, I call the tilted ones the tilted parallelograms, even though it sounds childish. And then there are if statements or while statements. Those are done in the diamonds. We're not going to flow chart one of those today, but we're going to use the other kind. And notice that there's only one, there's no dead ends until you get there. If you have a dead end, you kind of look real closely at your code and see if there's a problem. So the uh, logic for this is it's doing a bunch of stuff, and then it makes a decision. You know, if number was not equal to negative one, add to the total. All right, and then keep going. So we want to draw our own flow chart as soon as we do a few more of these. So input and output, again, those are in the tilted rectangles. Flow lines connect the steps. Generally, they go top to bottom. However, you see that if you hit the end of the page, it's okay to use a flow line to go back up to the top. You can also make it go to a little circle label that circle A, put another A here, and it's kind of like, you know, a, a you are here kind of thing. You've reached the end, you go back up to the top. Generally, they go down, but then when you have, you know, alternate kinds of logic, like decisions or whatever, you can jut off to the side. You know, and logically speaking, you wouldn't have to make a flow chart go top down. You can make it start at the bottom and go up, you know, or something like that. English readers, you know, they tend to read left, you know, to right and, you know, top to bottom. So it makes kind of sense to do it that way. So we're going to draw some flow charts. And in order to do that, we need to register at a site called LucidChart. Let me put that in our notes. We don't have any notes yet. Um, I'll put my notes inside of the idle document for now. www.lucidchart.com for flowcharting. This isn't the only way to flowchart. You can find other online flowcharting programs. Look like that one was trying to launch an editor. There's one that comes with Microsoft Office called Visio. So if you have Microsoft Office, you can type in Visio. However, that does require Microsoft Office, and I'm not sure it's available on Mac. Certainly not available on Linux. I like LucidChart because it's available, you know, on all your computers with a mouse. So, www.lucidchart.com, lucid spelled L-U-C-I-D, chart spelled chart.com. 
and it'll come up like this and it'll say sign on up free and unless you've already taken this course and already have an ID you're gonna to want to click sign up for free there's also a sign up with Google actually that's probably a better idea right because we all have Google addresses so sign up with Google type in your Raider address I'm gonna type in a, a goofy one because I've already created an account like la 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 at Raider dot rose dot edu click next Sorry, Google doesn't recognize that email. Oh, wow, really? Okay. JG Thompson at raider.rose.e. Wow, I've never had one actually validate. Okay. Then type in a password. Sign in. Probably doesn't matter if you use your school password or whatever. So you wind up with a page like this, hopefully. And I will ask you all to upload this. I hope. So what we do then is we want to make a flow chart. Seems like they have these choices here. Um, I feel like clicking on this thing that says document. Oh, that, that looks way too complicated. I'm just going to click blank here. Opening the shape manager. That's because all of all the shapes down on the side, there's way more symbols for other logical processes other than just programming flow charts. I don't know, maybe there's a you know architectural one and you can drop out trees or something like that. But the way you play with it is you just grab a shape. I'm going to grab one at random and then I'll probably delete it and drag it out here. And then grab another shape and drag it out there. And then remember those flow lines, we need to connect one to the other. So move your mouse right to one of those red circles and drag a line from one shape to the next. Now there's a shortcut. The shortcut is, is that you could go to one of those red circles, drag a line, even though it's not going to a shape, and then when you let up, then it lets you pick a shape automatically from this little quick pick menu. Right, saves you a step. Usually I forget to do that and I just draw the shapes and I hook them up later. Remember that every shape needs to have a line either going to it or coming from it. So if you drew a flow chart on an exam and you left off that line, I wouldn't give you full credit for it. Okay, I'm going to delete those guys because I want to make a better flow chart. So we need some logic in our heads before we draw the flow chart. So I'm going to pop open Notepad and type in some pseudocode. I want to make some pseudocode that will convert miles to feet. So I'm going to launch Notepad. Here's what my pseudocode looks like. Start, input miles, feet is equal to miles times 5280. I just happen to have that memorized. So this is the conversion formula. And then output miles. And we could write that as a program, but right now the flowchart is the important thing. So that's what I want my flowchart to do. And that's always kind of a problem trying to get all this stuff to fit on the same screen. That'll just kind of be my reminder there. Kind of bang that one on the other side of the world. So, 
start. That's going to be a terminator. I grabbed the o, the, the oval. The book suggests calling it a lozenge, like a cough drop. Eh, I think that'll do. I want to change the label on it. So I double click on that word terminator and I just make it start. And then when I'm done typing, I hit enter and we're good. I go to considerable trouble on long flow charts of resizing these things to be as small as possible so that they take up, you know, less white space around the words. You don't need to do that. The reason I do it is because I'm trying to fit a lot of shapes on the screen so that uh, it's easy for people at different to follow along. Some people draw faster than others. Okay, now I'm going to draw a shape. You can either do that arrow trick, you know, dragging a line straight down, or you could just grab it. Okay, what kind of shape is input? Input and output from our uh, PowerPoint. What did we say? Yeah, we're going to do a tilted. If we come over here, we look at the name of it. This program calls it a data block. Good enough. I'm, I'm happy to go with the data block. So, this says input miles. The next one, this is math. Math goes in a regular rectangle. And by the way, you do need to memorize which shape goes with which, because if you draw this and you put everything in a tilted block, one thing that people do is they start swapping them. They put all the input in rectangles and then they put the math in the tilted ones just because their brain does a little middle flip-flop. So here's our process block. That's what this one calls it. Feed is equal to miles times 5 to 80. And I forgot to draw a line, so I'm going to fix that now. All right. Two more steps. I need to do that output, and I need to do the pound sign end. Except I'm not going to put a pound sign in front of it. It wouldn't break anything. I could you know, make it start, but don't do that. All righty. So I need to type in the output statement. Output is just like input. It goes in the... Tilted rectangle, output miles. And if you want to, if you need to type on more than one line, you can hit Control Enter. I would expect that the Mac users need to hit Command Enter instead. So you could do that. This particular line was not long enough that it needed to be broken up like that, right? You can hit this little full screen button over here. See the uh, four arrows pointing away? each other. Please tell me I started the recording again. Yay. Okay. Just to give yourself a little bit of room, then you kind of lose your uh, palette, but you can go back and get your tools again by moving your mouse closer to the edge of the screen. And why am I doing that? Because I'm going to need an oval. Terminator. What is the command for that? Like the I would expect it would be uh, the command the propeller inner. All right, and this one needs to say stop. And by the way, I think the book shows the tilted rectangles tilting in the other way. I could be wrong about that. No, no. One textbook I use has them all going the other way. It doesn't matter. And I heard a question about the output statement. Sorry. Uh, won't that output the feet? Yeah, that was kind of dumb. Input miles, 100. Output miles. Yeah, this should be output feet. Thank you. All right. And while you're drawing it, you know, if the arrows look a little messed up and stuff like that, I don't care. If you care, you know, and if you have lots of time, you're not taking an exam or something, you can fix the alignment to some degree. 
there are all sorts of little options. You know, there are options down the side, there are options up here. It's to your advantage to play with this program on your own time. But for example, I'm going to hit Control A, get everything, Command A for the max. Then I'm going to go to the alignment button here and choose center. And that didn't do a darn thing. May have made it worse. Okay, so I'm going to come over here and right click on these things and do align to center. That worked. That worked. So I right clicked on it, pulled up the context sensitive menu. Still didn't do it perfectly. I see some. Then, if you really want to get whizzy fancy, there are these different themes you can pick. Well, that didn't work. I'm not spotting the themes right now anymore, so I'm going to skip that. You can color them, just like in any paint program. You can select something and then go find the, uh, the fill color. Maybe if I expand this, some more things will show up. Yeah, there's the paint bucket. There we go. You don't have to color them, and later on, I suggest coloring them very specifically. I'm not going to complain if you color them. Okay, so that's our flow chart. Let's compare that to our code. Our code is pretty simple, right? One thing I would like for you all to do is to go ahead and put your names on all your flow charts, just like you do on your code. So there's a big old T up here, right? You can grab the T, pull it out, type in your name, February 2, 6. I'm stuck on February 2nd. Okay. There we go. And one more thing you could do if you were fancy and you have a short programmer pseudocode is you could go back to your pseudocode. And I'm really not asking you all to do this at all. This is uh, just embellishment. Copy all of that. Come and make another T and paste the code. Now that doesn't look good because it needs to be, you know, left justified. So I would select all that text, and then I would hit the uh, align like that. Okay. If you're taking an exam, don't bother taking the time to do that. If you're doing homework, you saw that it took 30 seconds to do it, so feel free to do it. You know, I might even give extra credit for somebody who makes, you know, goes to the extra mile for doing flowcharts. Wow, I thought this. I thought I'd lined all this up, and it still looks lousy. Who cares? That'll illustrate that I don't care when you turn your homework in. Okay, so we have a flowchart. We need to save it. For one thing, we need to save it up on the cloud on a Lucid Chart, and then we need to save it to our hard drive so that you can upload it to me. So let's do the uh, save to Lucid Chart bit first. File, save as. Just call it Feb Six. Now we need to save it to the hard drive so that you could upload it in the Dropbox. That is called, not publish, I don't even know what that does, download as. And there's two formats that are of interest. One of them is the one I really want, which is PDF, right? Because just about every computer, phone, you know, can download and edit a view of PDF. So I choose Download as from the file menu. I choose PDF. Click download. It asks me where to save it. I don't feel like putting it in the uh, downloads folder or wherever it's suggesting by default. So I'm going to select my 1113. By the way, if you don't have your programming folder docked over in your favorites, I'd strongly recommend you do that. You just grab the folder, drag it to the bottom, you know, and then you're good to go. You have it there. Don't do that while you're editing, though, and it kind of messes things up, and I've already messed things up just by trying to demonstrate that. While saving, I mean. Okay, so that saved my document. I can validate that it's there. I'm going to go into Windows, Explorer, find that document. This is getting kind of full, but there it is. Sort by date. By the way, if your thing is not in details mode, you might want to put it in details mode 
it's different in every version of Windows, but you just come up here and you click on that little pull down there and choose details, but in a bunch of icons like that. Yeah, if you like icons, great, you know, but uh, swap between them to help you because I like sorting by date and then the newest thing I did pops up to the top. All right, so when I double click on that, it opens the PDF. That's what I want you to upload. We admire our art for a couple of minutes, then we close it and we upload it to the Dropbox. Okay, we're going to do pseudocode for a couple of more conversions. So, let's say that we're farmers. Convert cows to pigs. What's our formula? That's our task. Convert pow cows to pigs. The formula is that one cow is equal to 10 pigs. So, pigs equals cows times 10. This is the one we'll actually use. To begin with, I'm probably going to be giving you all the conversions. If you get stuck on a conversion, you just text me and I'll say, hey, pigs is equal to cows times 10. And then you'll go, but I wanted to know about miles and kilometers. And I'll say, oh, yeah. Okay. So we need to do that. Well, let's make this one. Oh, I need to crank the size of the text back up. And I kind of would like for y'all to type this in just so that it's available to you. But, you know, you could always slap it on your flash drive or whatever. So what do we need to do? What if we wanted this to be a little more friendly? We might put a print statement saying, you know, what we want them to do. But we don't have to. We could just do input pigs. No, we're inputting cows because we're converting cows to pigs. Input cows. Pigs is equal to cows times 10. Output pigs. Stop. That's the simplest one. Say we wanted to be a little more precise. We don't trust the programmer to do this right. We're going to give them some more instructions. So I'm going to come up with a more complicated one. This is a more expanded one. Output, enter the number of cows. Input, cows. Oh, and the book would have you type in set pigs is equal to cows. I don't care about the word set. Every programmer on the planet would know what this statement meant. Okay, so pigs is equal to cows times 10. Print or output, trying to use their language, output that is worth, or they are worth, comma, pigs, comma, pigs. Why do we have that word twice? Because this is what the user sees as a word, and this is what the user sees as a number. Okay. Right. They both do the same thing. And I, at this point, I don't care which style you choose. If you want kind of the verbose one, or if you want the shortest one. Eh. I'm going to call this terse. That's the terse version, you know, meaning as few words as possible. This is the verbose version, meaning more words to make it easier to understand. All right. Maybe you do one more. Our task. Convert light years to miles. Unfortunately, I don't remember that formula. So I'm going to cheat and use Google. So I'm going to pop up Google. So, and then I'm going to type in one light year in miles. And it's going to tell me, okay, maybe I don't really want to do that. Why don't we pick something easier? We already did miles to feet. 
Um, let's do. Let's do Celsius to Fahrenheit, like temperatures. Task: convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. You know somebody from uh, Canada? They're giving it a degree C. You want to find out whether 45 degrees is hot or cold. So the formula. I think I know this one by heart. F is equal to C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. Are you expected to know that? No, but you could Google up the formula if you had to. All right, using either the terse or the verbose, I'd like for you all to go ahead and type in like, you know, the five or six lines of pseudocode. And if you can't do it, that's fine. I'll come up and type it myself in a minute. All righty, so what ought to be the top line? Start. What's the next one? If we're doing it in the terse mode, what are we going to do? What's my top line going to be? Input yeah, input C. Then I'm going to use my formula. F is equal to C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. And if you look the formula up online, it would probably be, you know, a constant. I mean, a, a number, you know, a decimal rather than a division there and then output F, and then stop. Terse, not that you have to do it both ways. Start, print, enter or input the temperature in C. And then input C, then our formula, F is equal to C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. And then output the temperature is, why am I typing in a number? The temperature is comma or end quote, comma, F, that's our variable name, comma, degrees F, like that, and pound sign stop. This is one step closer towards, oh, and see here I'm mixing up my words, uh, print and output. I'm trying to be consistent, so I'm going to go and change that print to an output. Okay, so that's our pseudocode for two problems. Why am I doing that? I'm going to give you some uh, pseudocode homework. Speaking of homework, there are some assignments out there in MindTab. So here's how to find them. Go into D2L. Except this is uh, Tuesday, not Monday. Wrong class for me. Go to content. I'll probably also put a link in the announcements. And if you click on MindTap, you'll see that there's a Chapter 1 folder under MindTap. Probably all just listed there as soon as you click MindTap itself. There's a coding problem, a quiz, and a test. Let's eyeball them real quick. The quiz is only two questions long. So I clicked on that link that said quiz. And it didn't take me to the quiz. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to pop open chapter one. 
and then I'm going to go down to apply. Wow, I wish it had popped open. All three of them set, should have said counts towards grades. I'll fix that. Debugging exercises. That's not the one that I wanted. Okay. I should have hidden the other two. The only one that counts. Just do the ones with the orange. But anyways, the quiz. I'm going to pop on quiz. And if you're not doing this right now, that's fine. If you want to do it right now, we're to, we're actually can take a look at what we're doing. I'm going to zoom it, and there, match the definition with the appropriate term. By the time you read this, you'll be you'll know all this stuff. You may not have read the entire chapter yet. I'd like for y'all to complete it real soon. So language rules. The language rules are what? The rules of a language are its syntax. Yeah, so I need to cook up a line between those two. So I click one, I click the other. That's good to go. Hardware is computer system equipment. So I'm going to click those two. Now they're probably in a random order on yours, right? So is that true? Or yours look exactly like mine? Random. random. OK. So the language translator, the thing that turns your source code into computer code is the, yep, it's the compiler. Well, this is getting uh, easier because we only have two choices left. What is the order of instructions? It's the logic. I'm kind of giving you a hint by going between them. And then lastly, another word for program is software. Okay. Oh, I said it was only two statements. Looks like it's three statements. So I'm going to save that question. Question saved. It seems to have graded it automatically for me, but maybe that's because I'm instructor mode. I'm not sure that it gives you the assignment score as soon as, uh, as you submit it. Somebody tell me. Once you click save, does it give you an assignment score up at the top? No. no. All right. Alrighty. Draw a flowchart or write pseudocode to represent the logic of a program that allows a user to enter a value. The program multiplies the value by 10 and outputs the result. That shouldn't be too hard. That's your formula, right? You're just going to have to pick the name for the variable. Call it number, you know, input number. So you're going to draw a flowchart or write some pseudocode and you're going to upload it. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to grade these things by hand because how could it know if the flowchart was correct? How could it know if the pseudocode was correct? So if you get a grade, if it shows you a grade, don't go, oh man, I failed it. It probably means that it, it graded it and it didn't know how to do it. So that was assignment two, or problem two of the quiz. And then problem three is another pseudocode. Draw flowchart or write pseudocode allows the user to enter a value for one edge of a cube. The program calculates the surface area of one side of the cube, the surface area of the whole cube, and its volume. So it's actually going to be outputting three things rather than one. It's going to be calculating and outputting three things. So I think we better do, and this will be the last task of the day, pseudocode that does a problem like that, maybe a sphere, because we'll want to calculate the radius, the surface area, and the volume. So we can do that. That's our problem. I'm going to go to Notepad, write one more task. Task, convert radius of sphere to circumference area and volume. And you know what? I don't remember all these formulas, so I'm just going to wind up Googling them. I remember some of them. So, formulas. I think the circumference is 2 pi r. You know what? I'm just going to abbreviate it. Circ is equal to 2 times pi times r. So 
3.14159, I don't care how precise you make pi. It's actually got a constant defined in it, which we could use, but I'm just going to go with a pure number, times r. That's how you get the circumference. The volume of a sphere is 4 divided by 3 times pi times r squared. And in this language, you can do squaring and cubing using the exponent, which is two, ex two uh, stars rather than one. And yeah, I know that you, uh, you wish you could use the up arrow just like you've done in other, but in this language, it's like that. All right, I have to look up the one for the surface area unless somebody knows it off the top of their head. Surface area of sphere. There it is, 4 pi r squared. Okay. Area is equal to 4 times pi times r to the power of 2. Alrighty, so what kind of input do we need? Do we need lots of pieces of input because we've got three formulas or we really only need one. We need the radius. So it's pound sign. Nope, don't even need pound sign. Although I've been putting pound sign in front of the starts and the stops. Don't need a pseudocode. Sorry about that. I could go back and remove them all. You know what? I like my pound signs. Okay, so input R, or I could use the whole word radius. Wouldn't be a big deal either, either way. Input R, and then I need those three formulas. Honestly, I could just cut and paste them. That'd probably be faster. <laughs> I'm going to type them. You can cut and paste them. Circumference is equal to 2 times pi times R. Volume is equal to 4 divided by 3 times pi times R to the power of 3. Area is equal to 4 times 3.14159 times r to the power of 2. And then we would need to output those three things. Output, circumference, comma, volume, comma, area. That's the terse mode. That's enough. Alrighty, I need to make a Dropbox for these things so that we can get them uploaded. So I'm going to save these files as February 6 notes.txt. The only thing that I insist on you uploading would be the PDF. If you didn't get the PDF done, just upload a note saying that you tried. I'm going to take roll based on what you upload, so please upload something. All right, if you refresh your Dropbox, you see the Dropbox. Into the Dropbox, please insert your pseudocode if you typed it up. So I want the flowchart and the pseudocode. If you feel like putting the PY file we did at the beginning, great, you can do that as well. Why not? This file. And if you didn't type it in, that's okay. I, I do want the PDF. These notes will be posted. I almost always post the notes. But if you typed them in, you know, why not put them in there? Then you know you have them. 